Chapter 22. He hears the first bird of the day over an hour before sunrise. Not that he has a watch or a clock to gauge the hour. To pass the time, John Peter Zinger not only wrote letters, but also took to perfecting his artistic skills, where once his drawings were simplistic, now were they all well detailed and done with special care to distance and perspective. Lately, has he been drawing two huge three-masted galleons squaring off on the stormy North Atlantic. One could almost wonder if there was a metaphor in his drawing, as if the two galleons represented the prosecution and defense as they sought to gain optimum firing position over the, one another while the storm threw them both about. Still a popular man with the working class public, former Governor Rip Van Dam receives nods as he makes his way down Nassau Street. While Cos Cosby had ruined his political career, he is still looked upon as a man of the people, and many dared hope he'd regain his position if he ever found a way to depose Cosby. A young newsie stands at the corner of Nassau and Wall Street, not far from the courthouse, selling his New York Weekly journals to passers-by. He cannot help but notice the familiar and dignified man moving up Nassau Street and folds a newspaper in preparation. Paper Governor Van Dam? asks the newsie. Rip Van Dam smiles. I'm just Mr. Van Dam nowadays, son. He hands the newsie a few pence in exchange for the newspaper. The newsie watches him open the paper to read the headline in bold letters, Jury to be struck in Zenger trial. Hearing a commotion, Rip Van Dam looks up to the courthouse to see John Chambers exiting the building and moving down the steps, swarmed by reporters from other cities, scholars, and fellow barristers hungry for details. Yawning, Anna looks through the tall front windows over the rooftops of buildings across the street and sees the first rays of sunlight radiate in. She looks back to the tired apprentices stacking and cording the next bundles of completed newspapers which will be taken by carriage north to Boston, south to Philadelphia, and numerous coastal communities in between. So fatigued is she, that she, is she that she barely hears James Alexander as he rambles on. My friend, former Governor Rip Van Dam, told me that the jury was struck this afternoon and notices to appear went out. Mr. Chambers exits the courthouse and was surrounded by those hungry for details. Can you imagine the, this case, the way this case is made? Anna sighs. I imagine Lewis Morris expects treachery, too. He says little, but yes, he does, replies James Alexander. The public is losing its fear of the crown, not just here, in every city. You must be proud, says Anna as she sips her coffee. Your words, your cause, coming to life. Anna, those articles represent people thinking, envisioning, that there must be a better way than this. All of this talk of a better way. A better way for whom? All of us, replies James Alexander as he throws his hands up excitedly. Do you realize where you'd be if John gave your names to Richard Bradley? Asks Anna in an annoyed tone. Where would your idealistic talk of a better way be if none of you woke up one day? James Alexander gulps down some coffee and gestures out the window at the rays of sun rising. Some of us did not wake up to see that sunrise this morning. But if those that survive do not continue the cause, then our friends die for nothing. He watches Peter enter through the back door and help the apprentices bundle up more newspapers. Think on this. Do you want your children, your grandchildren, to be capable of thinking grand thoughts, but to be fearful of prosecution, simply for speaking them? Anna looks to Peter as he stacks and wraps cords around newspapers. Would this newspaper even be around to provide him a livelihood when he and the other two children grew up? Or would every colonial paper be ghosted by a magistrate who edited content, only put forth views of the, the crown, and subverted the truth to further any governor's agenda? Of course you don't, continues James Alexander. None of us do. I understand the immense burdens your family has endured for us. John understands his case goes far beyond just him. Why do you think he stood up and refused bail? He was not speaking for himself, but he's my husband, not a martyr for your cause. 
Anna's outburst stops everyone working and has them looking to her. James Alexander glances to them and looks back to Anna to see how uh, to see her now extremely alert. In fact, she looks quite capable of violence. Anna, we were all of us imprisoned by the crown, explains James Alexander. It took John's arrest for everyone to realize it. If he wins, we will be a step closer to freedom for the crown. And if he loses, what disappears? James Alexander does not mince words. I'm certain you remember, you remember stories about the days of Cromwell. Anna's face goes blank, realizing that it can happen here. Chapter 23, August 4th, 1735. Sunlight shines into the barred window, revealing an empty cell. The door is wide open. The candle is out. There is no sheet, no straw-filled mattress on the bed anymore. How long has Zenger's cell been empty? It took little time to replace John Symes with a younger, more impressionable sheriff with political aspirations that persons like Harrison could more easily manipulate. With his right hand firmly clasped over the grip of a pistol, the young sheriff walks beside John Peter Zenger across the commons on the way to the courthouse. William Smith flanks John and notices he is more tense than usual. For one thing, Sheriff Sines never allowed him a walk before going to trial. This sheriff did but only after cording off the entire route with over a dozen redcoats who let no civilian within 100 feet. John could not help but wonder if there was some agenda behind this younger sheriff's handling of the situation, or maybe it was his final look at society he'd be departing from soon. John, we did not want to concern you earlier, says William Smith. Right away, John Peter Zenger has the concerned look on his face as if wondering... How heavy the other shoe will be when it finally drops right on top of him. William Smith continues, Understand that Mr. Chambers was not certain that he alone could adequately defend you. His boot heel slamming down, John Peter Zenger suddenly stops and displays the, the annoyed expression of a man sick of being toyed with. And you choose now to bring this to my attention? William Smith is taken aback by John's reaction. He's searching for the words to calm him down, but he's at a loss. Something dark across the commons catches his eye and, his, and he looks left to see a statuesque mid-60s Scotsman, Andrew Hamilton, moving toward the line of redcoats coordinating the commons. Hamilton needs only gesture with his hands to make the redcoats stand aside and allow him admittance to the commons. Following Smith's gaze, John Peter Zenger looks across the commons to see the long black floor cloak flowing around Andrew Hamilton. The fact that the Redcoats gasp and stay clear of the middle-aged man perplexes him no end. They'd have charged and banded anybody else. Who is this man that no one wants to challenge him? And how come he'd never heard of this man before? I bring it up now as I am no longer concerned, continues William Smith as a relieved smile comes to his face. Reinforcements have arrived. Taking the long strides of a man bristling with confidence, Andrew Hamilton approaches John Peter Zenger. The young sheriff actually takes a step back, as if having no real faith in that pistol on his hip. William Smith steps in to stand between John Peter Zenger and the ominous Andrew Hamilton. John Peter Zenger, meet our friend in Philadelphia, Andrew Hamilton. John Peter Zenger is still confused as Andrew Hamilton smiles and offers his hand. I do hope my tardiness did not alarm you. An honor to be of service, Mr. Zenger. John is about to take Andrew Hamilton's hand when suspicion stops him and he withdraws. Nothing about this man is normal. Philadelphia. Philadelphia, if memory serves, you prosecuted a libeler in Philadelphia. How do I not, how do I know you are not Cosby's wolf in our fold? William Smith is quick to mediate. John, I assure you, understandable concerns, Mr. Smith, says, says Andrew Hamilton. However, Mr. Zenger, task your memory further to remind you that I prosecuted one Andrew Bradford. Andrew Bradford, the son of my, firm, my former employer, asks John Peter Zenger. The same. 
replies Andrew Hamilton. He proved a pale shadow of the man you respect, though he well earned his penance. You, sir, have earned our freedom, and that is what I am here to win for you. Now does John Peter Zenger shake William Andrew Hamilton's hand to the satisfaction of William Smith. The young sheriff is not so satisfied with having seen this man walk through his guards, and he can only imagine how having him arrive at the 11th hour will affect the outcome of, this, of the uh, Zenger trial. Hopefully Harrison does not catch word of Hamilton's interest through the guards. Your freedom awaits, gentlemen, jibes the young sheriff sarcastically. Walking shoulder to shoulder, John Peter Zenger, William Smith, and Andrew Hamilton march across the commons while hundreds of citizens, wearing their best attire, stand behind the redcoats and applaud. The sheriff smirks as the three walk up the front steps of the courthouse. The two, two standing guards pull open the doors and nod as the sheriff passes. The twelve jurors take their seats in the jurors box and look to see the spectators crowding rapidly into the rows of seats. They cannot help but see how nervous the redcoats appear as they exchange glances and take notice of how many blue collar spectators are sitting so close together that there is no room whatever on the long benches left unused. By the time the well-off spectators arrive in their well-kept suits, the courthouse is standing room only, but the redcoats are not about to turn them away, given how much of the tax burden they represent. Despite being jammed shoulder to shoulder with the other spectators, Anna and Peter still manage to turn to see Andrew Hamilton and William Smith into the courtroom on either side of John Peter's anger. Despite his fatigue, John displays none of it, and instead marches with his counsels right down the center of the courtroom. Walking down the center aisle, Andrew Hamilton looks back over his shoulder and nods to William Bradford, who stares back in disbelief to see him here? Here William Bradford had come to see his former apprentice fight one last time for his life, and in this very room moves the man who prosecuted his son years ago. And what was more, the Zenger family had nowhere the fiscal resources to afford counsel so elite. And yet, Bradford bore witness to Andrew Hamilton clasping hands with John Chambers and William Smith to discuss the case while John embraced Anna and Peter across the banister. This is a day for precedence. Sitting down at the prosecutor's desk, Francis Harrison looks across to see the Zenger family embracing. The sight of this disgusts him. His own jealousy twists and grinds those pancakes he ate for breakfast and leave behind a feeling of sudden nausea that even the loudest belch would not subside. So he sits there in angry silence and hopes the ruling provides his final satisfaction. The bailiff enters the room and stands before the bench. The side door opens to chambers and judges Delancey and Phillips enter. All rise! Those not already standing are quick to do so and go silent. The bailiff continues. Hear ye, hear ye. By order of your esteemed Governor William H. Cosby, the trial of John Peter Zenger versus the Crown is so ordered on the fourth day of August, 1735. Judge James Delancey and Frederick Phillips, keepers of the faith and defenders of the law, presiding. Judge Delancey slams his gavel once, signaling the start of the trial. He takes his seat and gestures to the sheriff. Sheriff, let the names of the jurors be ranged in the order they were struck. Taking position near the jurors' box, the sheriff unrolls a parchment and reads aloud. Called and sworn to this court are jurors Thomas Hunt, the foreman, Harmanus Rutgers, Stanley Holmes, Edward Mann, John Bell, Samuel Weaver, Andre Smallshock, Egbert von Borsum, Benjamin Hildreth, Abraham Keteltus, John Gourlay, and Hercules Wendover. Judge Phillips looks to the prosecutor, Richard Bradley. Mr. Attorney, you may open with your information. Standing, Richard Bradley nods to the judges, then to the jury. May it please your honors and you, gentlemen of the jury, John Peter Zenger is charged with and has pleaded not guilty to the crime of printing and publishing false, scandalous, and seditious libels. He then turns to the judges. This libeler 
having no regard for law or justice, has scandalized Governor Cosby, the colonial representatives of King George, and all who serve under him. He turns to the jury and gestures to them. Libeling has long been discouraged, for it can only bring ill will and bloodshed to all involved. Hearing the rapid scrawl of crow quill pens, John Peter Zenger looks to his three counselors to see them rapidly taking notes and outlining arguments on paper. He sees a shadow loom over him and looks up just in time to see Richard Bradley swagger overly conf over confidently toward him with a pompous grin. In his publication, the New York Weekly Journal, the accused has made note of citizens of New York jumping from frying pan to fire if they were to relocate to the state of New Jersey. Further, did he publish articles of witnesses unnamed seeing men's deeds destroyed, judges arbitrarily taken off cases, secret courts erected by night, trials by jury revoked, men of estates being denied their votes for not swearing oaths, and those are merely the beginning. To these libels, how plead you, John Peter Sanger? Stupid question, thought John Peter Zenger, as he, as a, with a defiant smirk twitches onto his face, he stands up ramrod straight and stares at the judges. Your Honors, to these charges do I plead not guilty, and stand ready to prove it. Several spectators clap their hands, stop in rhythm and cheer approval. Anna puts her arm around Peter, notices how pleased her husband is by the attention, and gasps, he's actually enjoying this. He looks to Peter, she looks to Peter to see him smiling too. Whatever fear of the crown the boy had was gone when he saw his father stare down those two judges. Andrew Hamilton smiles and looks to his fellow counsels, who are likewise pleased by their client's confidence. He looks to Judge Delancey, who feigns being amused by Zenger's comment. In actuality, Delancey is outraged that this printer isn't begging for his life like so many other has. But if nothing else, Delancey could often muffle his displeasure and make the untrained eye think he was still in control. And have you anything more to say, asks Judge Delancey. Oh, I could think of many things to add, replies John Peter Zenger. The spectators briefly guffaw their approval. Judge Phillips shoots them a look, but that does not stifle them. John Peter Zenger glances back to them as if to say, there's more, and then they go silent with anticipation. But in all respects to your honors, Mr. Chambers has not favored me with his notes, so I will not do him injustice by pretending to set down his argument. Enamored with his boldness, several single women snap open their fans and waft their saints in John Peter Zenger's direction. Sitting in front of those women and smelling their scents first, Anna turns back to them, curls back her, her upper lip and shows them her razor-sharp teeth. Suddenly realizing their error, the women drop their fans and appear apologetic to Anna. Anna turns her attention back to her husband. A faint smile cracks on her face as she's pleased so many are envious of John. Stepping around the table, John Chambers takes center court. Suddenly blood pressures in the judges are greatly reducing as they know it is Chambers' way to mediate through a situation rather than cause agitation. This only makes them more open to receive whatever information he may wish to present. Your Honors, Mr. Attorney, Gentlemen of the Jury, and Spectators all, for a libel to be proven, a single person must be named and targeted, and there must be no doubt who is meant. And should any doubt be present, then was truly a libel committed? He turns to Andrew, Andrew Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, might you elaborate further? Before Andrew Hamilton is even out of his chair, the judge's blood pressure are rising and they are expecting the worst. Judge Phillips glances to John Chambers with a look on his face as if knowing he was just set up. John Chambers pays Phillips no mind and simply takes his seat while Andrew Hamilton swaggers center court. John Peter Zager actually relaxes in his chair and exchanges glances with John Chambers. Standing center court, Andrew Hamilton takes hold of his, hold of his white, his long coat lapels and turns to the judges. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. 
May it please your honours, I do not deny that Mr. Zenger made publications of complaint. One has the right to complain, so long as it is done truthfully. He turns to Richard Bradley, and this truth would be established had Mr. Attorney examined the witnesses he took such effort to subpoena. He gestures to the journeyman, the three apprentices seated beside Anna, each with a subpoena signed by Bradley in hand. I would confess, as does Mr. Zenger, that he published his journals, and I do hope in doing so that he has committed no crime. That is to say, that he has printed no untruth. Richard Bradley looks to the judges, then to the jury, looking back at him as if knowing that Hamilton put him in check. Then if your honors pleases, since Mr. Hamilton has confessed to the fact, I think our witnesses may be discharged as we have no further occasion for them. <laughs> Richard Bradley is playing right into Hamilton's grip. If you brought them here only to prove the printing and publishing of these papers, we should acknowledge and abide that, says Andrew Hamilton. Bailiff, do see the witnesses out, commands Judge Phillips. Peter Zenger watches as the bailiff moves down the aisle to where the spectators sit and gestures to the door. The journeyman and the three apprentices stand up, step into the aisle and follow the bailiff through the doors. The courtroom is strangely silent as the spectators watch for the next move by either side. Mr. Attorney, you will proceed, demands Judge Delancey with a hint of impatience. Thank you, Your Honor, says Richard Bradley as he turns to the jury. Gentlemen, I think your duty is clear. Mr. Hamilton already confessed to his client, printing and publishing libels. Surely you must find verdict for your king. Or not so neither, Mr. Attorney, counters Andrew Hamilton. It is not mere printing and publishing that make a libel. You must prove his words untrue. Is motive malicious, his results generating sedition and scandal. He turns to the jury, and should he fail to prove the charges, then the journals were not liable, and we not guilty. Francis Harrison is writing the court record when Andrew Hamilton walks right past him to address the jury. Know that Libel defined is the malicious defamation against the reputation of one who is living or the memory of one who is dead. Quotes well, Andrew Hamilton as he glances back at Francis Harrison. However, there are those corrupt and wicked magistrates ruling in the king's name who have made state and people suffer for their own profit. He shrugs and gestures to himself. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> the, expect, uh, the spectators explode in laughter. Francis Harrison looks over his shoulder to see them laughing, pointing and smirking at him. He feels a sudden heaviness in his stomach that descends into his intestines. But it's not like he can dismiss himself and do anything about it. He can only watch Andrew Hamilton walk right past him toward the defendant's desk. At this point, does John Chambers stand up to face the judges? This all seems too practiced, too prepared for Harrison's comfort, and he entertains thoughts of Bradley perhaps not being up to the task. Simple though it should be. No one denies that Mr. Zenger published a newspaper, says John Chambers. That is no crime, but realize how Mr. Attorney's defect of proof has not proven Mr. Zenger a liar, nor his intentions malicious or seditious. Without this proof, Mr. Attorney's case, the state's cause, and the court's charges are invalid. Francis Harrison feels a cramp in his stomach, as if it, like the prosecution's case, just took a hard hit at midships. He watches as John Chambers, Andrew Hamilton, and William Smith stand shoulder to shoulder like a barricade between the judges and the citizen spectators. It does little comfort for him that Richard Bradley stands up to further the state's cause. Um, do excuse me, Your Honors. The defense's arguments aside, do you not see what sacred entity the government is? asks Richard Bradley, 
sacred and above answering the winding of common subjects. May it please your honor, I do agree that with Mr. Attorney that government is a sacred thing, says Andrew Hamilton. But I differ when he insinuates that complaints sp spoken by men under bad administration is libelous. It's a simple complaint. Richard Bradley feels an invasion of his own space when Andrew Hamilton walks over to his prosecutor's table, picks up issues 13 and 14 of the New York Weekly Journal, and holds them high. When I read these papers, without Mr. Attorney's innuendo, I had not the art to know Governor Cosby was a subject of criticism continues Andrew Hamilton as he puts the papers down and turns to the jury, for he was never mentioned by name. I was inclined to believe that whoever wrote these articles had an extraordinary zeal for liberty, unlike Mr. Attorney's own zeal for power, which had him setting up the star chambers where the judgment would never be made precedent to the public. He gestures to the jury, fortunately, there are eyes upon you who will mark and remember. Richard Bradley's expression is one of pleading as he looks to the judges to intervene for him. However, the judges cannot do so without showing weakness against the defense counsel by aiding Bradley. They can only watch Andrew Hamilton swagger by and play to the spectators. Remember, if you will, the recent Brewster case. Here was a gentleman, a printer in fact, who published that we subjects might defend rights, liberties, and properties by arms should the king go about to destroy us. Andrew Hamilton turns on the judges. The chief justice told Mr. Brewster how his words were looked upon as treasonous. We all know the crown's punishment for treason, but wisely do the chief justice understand that the range of difference between speech and action, speech he spans his wides apart at physical action. It is to wisdom that Mr. Brewster lives today. Impressed by Hamilton's logic, the jury members exchange nodding glances. They watch as Andrew Hamilton turns his back on the judges and once again plays to the enthusiastic spectators. It is not surprising to see a subject receive commission from the king and soon imagine himself empowered as a king. What does surprise me is to see you, the people, acknowledge and support the, these commissioned persons even to your own destruction. Once again, does Andrew Hamilton span his arms wide to make a point? Can you not tell the difference between a king and his governor. The spectators are aghast. Whispers of, like lambs to slaughter, that go from one spectator to another. Now do they realize their error in allowing these appointed magistrates to walk upon them so many times that it had become too common a practice. Awestruck at Hamilton's bold statement, Richard Bradley looks to the jury to see them entranced. Realizing he's losing more ground, he shoves his chair back loudly and stands to oppose with fists clenched. I know not what the gentleman means by these comparisons. The case before the court is whether Mr. Zegger is guilty of libeling His Excellency, the Governor of New York, his administration, period. He steps out from behind his desk and sweeps his, his wide arm gesture of Andrew Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton has confessed to his client, having printed articles that disquieted the minds of the permanents. He grabs up issues 13 and 14. And if these journals be not libelous, then surely there is no such thing as a libel. Andrew Hamilton smiles as if amused. May it please your honors, but I cannot agree. The spectators laugh. The air goes out of Richard Bradley's lungs. And Francis Harrison rolls his eyes and grumbles. Here's a bloody surprise. John Peter Sanger tries to keep from laughing as he watches Andrew Hamilton turn to the judges. He'd never seen a courtroom turned into a theater atmosphere. 
never before, and he could only wonder where the charismatic Scotsman was going from here. Though I freely acknowledge the existence of libels, I must insist that my, what my client is charged with is not libel, says Andrew Hamilton as he turns to the jury. Mr. Attorney has failed to mention or prove a single false statement written in Mr. Zenger's journals. I, I, I think I did not omit the word false, says Richard Bradley with a nervous nudge to the judge. It has been said already. Andrew Hamilton points across the room at Richard Bradley as if looking down the barrel of a dueling pistol. I am interested, sir. Is there such a thing as a true libel? What manner of spotted zebra be this? <laughs> you cannot give the truth of a libel as evidence, Mr. Hamilton, snaps Judge Delancey with, as he shakes his finger nervously. A libel cannot be justified whether true or no. It is still libel. Andrew Hamilton looks now to the judge half his age and need only point his finger up to capture Delancey's full attention. To the contrary, if a libel was true, then it would not be a libel. I would challenge you, gentlemen, to show this court such an animal. Several jury members gasp as if hearing a revelation. They watch Andrew Hamilton approach the judges, knew that the information for libels was brought to maturity in the court of the Star Chamber. He turns to the jury. Odd. Odd. How there is no standard criteria to inform the public what is libel and what is not. No public trial decisions, no legal precedents, no court re reports made in public knowledge. He turns to that public, the spectators. Odd how the prosecution has the luxury of building cases upon trials never seen by a jury. Never recorded by a reporter. And more tragic is how the accused never met the accuser. Nor was he ever seen after the gavel was last hammered. Mr. Hamilton, shouts Judge Delancey, you find yourself mistaken. For in Koch's institutes will you find informations for libel long before the Star Chambers. Andrew Hamilton knows this precedent all too well. Ah, Mr. Chief Justice makes note of Coke 3, the case of John D. Northampton, put on trial for his letters concerning the poor conduct of the King's proxy, Sir William Scott. He turns to the jury. Interesting how in that case, as in this one, there was never a published list of words or phrases forbidden by the state. He just happens to glance at the desk of Francis Harrison sits at. Whose desk does that list reside in? Several spectators glare at Francis Harrison as if wondering if he has a list of forbidden words hidden in the prosecutor's desk. Harrison just sinks in his chair and feels his stomach flip over. Do tell me how any prosecutor builds a case upon nothing, snaps Andrew Hamilton as he gestures to Richard Bradley. And tell me if it makes sense to punish a man in the same degree for telling a true libel as a false one. He takes a step at Bradley. Come, come, counselor. Am I eluding you? Please do make effort to keep up. I shall go on whilst you consider. Richard Bradley cannot think of anything to say in his defense. In fact, he knows he should not be on the defensive, and yet he has no offense to offer either. He can only watch Andrew Hamilton further his case with the spectators, the jury, the judges. Is Mr. Attorney attempting to prove that revealing truth is a greater libel, a greater sin than telling a lie? If he has facts and witnesses, then produce them and let us hear them out. Four. Sad case would it be for a man to be judged and the truth buried with him. Andrew Hamilton turns on the judges again. Chief Justice Holt tried a case of this kind. He ruled that he who will take it upon him to write things, it lies to him to prove them 
at his peril. Now does he turn on Richard Bradley, having given him time to consider. Now, sir, we once again acknowledge printing and publishing those journals, and we stand ready to defend them at our peril. Several spectators cannot help but applaud the theater they are witnessing. Angrily does Judge Phillips grab his gavel and is ready to strike when the applause abruptly stops. Judge Delancey holds out his open hand to the bailiff. Let me see the book. The bailiff is aware all eyes are upon him as he goes to the bookshelves on the left side of the courtroom and pulls a thick book of legal precedents marked Holt. Then does he move to Judge Delancey and place the heavy book in his open hand. Prepared for the weight of the book, the judge gently brings it toward himself and opens the book halfway to scan for the dates and case numbers relevant. John Peter Zenger saw the book the bailiff handed Delancey and glances to see the same book open before John Chambers. Both of them, both sides, are playing this round according to the decision of Chief Justice Holt. He watches as Richard Bradley approaches the bench and speaks in low tones with the judges. His own counsel seems not to need more time to consider, as if they already have played the scenario out before entering the courtroom. He just wished he knew what the probable results were. Judge Phillips glances at the page and is showing the youthful nervousness that Delancey manages to suppress. Richard Bradley slowly pulls a handkerchief from his inner coat pocket, wipes sweat off his face and then replaces it in hopes that no one saw him do that. Great to the governor's detriment if Hamilton proves Zenger's journal's true, says Judge Phillips in low tones. He's looking on a worst case scenario. Judge Delancey closes the book. He has no intention of hiding behind a lowered voice and making the state look any weaker. Mr. Attorney, you have heard the case cited. You do know Holt's decision. What say you? The law is clear, replies Richard Bradley with a shrug. They cannot justify a libel. True or otherwise, the crime, the confession is plain. That, that I submit to the court. Judge Delancey smiles smugly. Mr. Hamilton, the court is of the opinion that you ought not be permitted to prove the truth of the Zenger journals. Andrew Hamilton is visibly displeased as he looks from the judges to Richard Bradley, then to Francis Harrison, who is now reviving his smug act. He is prepared to prove the journals true and the state at fault for mistreating the subjects. He knows he has an audience in the jury to hear what proof he has to present. And yet the judges will not permit him to enter that evidence to prove his case. If he cannot enter proof, then he has no more case than the state does. He looks to the judges grimly. These are star chambers indeed. I was in the hopes that practice was dead in this court. Mr. Hamilton, this court has delivered their opinion, states Judge Delancey. We expect you to use us in good manners and not argue. Nor invoke the name of dreaded courts past in effort to gain sympathy, adds Judge Phillips as he fakes a polite smile. But otherwise, will you have all the liberty you reasonably desire? I thank your honors. Taking hold of his long la uh, coat lapels, Andrew Hamilton slowly advances toward the jury. William Smith and John Chambers quietly look over the notes to formulate a new approach. John Peter Zenger watches them as the papers slip through their fingers and realizes the two men are out of ideas as to how to proceed. If, this, if his counsels cannot enter evidence, how can they prove and therefore win his case? Running his hand along the banister of the jury box, Andrew Hamilton makes eye contact with no one. His concentration plunges to a level seldom observed. Every eye in the building is turning to him. Reaching the end of the jury box, Andrew Hamilton suddenly turns to face the jury. New approach in mind. Gentlemen of the jury, it is to you I must appeal. You were summoned from the neighborhood as you are believed to have the best knowledge of the case we try. 
and to find verdict against my client, you take it upon yourselves to say his journals were seditious. Of this I have great apprehension. As we are denied liberty to prove the journals true, let the suppression of evidence be proof in Mr. Zanger's favor. And since we cannot examine witnesses, I will shorten dispute with Mr. Attorney and leave the fate of my client with you. With renewed confidence, Richard Bradley stands up and swaggers to the, over to the jury. Numerous eyes are still on Andrew Hamilton. Richard Bradley clears his throat to gain their attention. <coughs> the prosecution's proof in the, is in libel's definition. The malicious defamation expressed to blacken the memory of one who is dead or the reputation of one that is alive. Have not Mr. Zenger's journals truly blackened our governor's reputation? Your definitions are broad. To the specific, I address this uncertainty, the difficulty to know which words are scandalous or not, says Andrew Hamilton as he picks up paper and quill and holds them out to Richard Bradley. I would ask you, sir, what is your list for establishing libel? Tell me which words can be said and which cannot, and I shall write them and see to their publication. Bradley is hesitant to take paper and pen from Hamilton. He actually glances to the judges. They do not respond. So Hamilton advances menacingly and shoves the paper and pen in his face. Well, out with it, man! List them all, A to Z! Bradley does not take the paper, so Hamilton turns to the gallery of spectators, anxious, anxiously watching it. Why are you, the citizens, never told the forbidden words? In ignorance of the law, you cannot help but commit libel. Mr. Hamilton, how can you not know that all words are libelous when spoken in a, scoff spoken in a scoffing manner, says Judge Delancey. Oh, I am glad. Find the court of this opinion, says Andrew Hamilton with a trace of sarcasm in his voice. It follows that these twelve men must understand the context of Mr. Zenger's words to be false and generating scandal. Oh, and only this can find us guilty. No, Mr. Hamilton, replies Judge Delancey. The jury may only find that Mr. Zenger printed those journals. It is to the court to decide libel or no. It is the nature of a special verdict where a jury must leave matter of law to us. It might please your honors for a jury to do so, suggests Andrew Hamilton in a manner that even taunts the judges. But understand they do, they may do otherwise, for none of them desire to be subjects of a star chamber without peers or counsel to review their fates. You test the court's patience again, Mr. Hamilton, snaps Judge Delancey. Surely no innocent man takes offense. All men agree that we are governed by the best of kings. The spectators try to contain their laughter. And as such, I cannot understand the court feeling slighted. Andrew Hamilton turns to the jury. Can you? I have the blessings we enjoy under his present majesty, making it impossible for me to offend. Now does the jury chuckle and exchange amused glances. Judge Phillips shoots the laughing jury a hostile look, and they can only struggle not to guffaw. Turning away from the jury, Andrew Hamilton stares down the judges and fades away his sarcastic wit. Though it is true that men in power enjoy exemption from answering complaints and are harder to approach for the wrongs they do. It is also true that a people mistreated by a governor may feel no obligation to support him as he goes about destroying his province, his people, and their privileges. For what privilege has a man if he must be arrested simply for informing his neighbors of mistreatment? Can a man speak freely to his God, yet be forced to hold his tongue in the shadow of a governor. Who elevated any governor so lofty? His Majesty, perhaps. And Andrew Hamilton pretends to think me a second. And whom does a governor complain to? To a House of Representatives? He turns on Francis Harrison. Do you know? In the shadow of the judges does Francis Harrison fear to reply. 
The governor is not on trial, warns Judge Delancey. One of the spectators grumbles, a bloody order for you. <laughs> Which has the judges suddenly peering around to see who said that. Nor did I say he was, continues Andrew Hamilton. But consider that people have the right to inform their neighbors about men in authority, harming them, harming them through craft or open violence. I speak not for the entire populace, however. There are a few men, he glances to the judges who feel strongly obliged to support the governor. Such men let his occasional misdeeds slip by to remain in his favor. He walks along the jury box regarding each juror. Though I hope even obligated men with honor and conscience would realize when liberty is in danger and, like Englishmen, would realize, would sacrifice political favor rather than be accessory to entailing slavery. He turns on Richard Bradley. Then there is a third cast of men in whom I have no hope. He looks down on Francis Harrison. They who cast aside morality and join with power in any form. He turns on the judges now. They who gratify themselves at the expense of those they feel pleased to hate. It is their restraint of speech, of thought. That is false. The judges actually lean back in their tall chairs as they watch Andrew Hamilton approach the bench and continue his oral barrage. It is their method to dispense hate that is scandalous, bellows Andrew Hamilton as he turns to, to the jury nearby. There is no consistency to their law and no greater uncertainty than laws regarding scandal. Do think on this, gentlemen. How must a man write, speak, read, sing, even laugh, not to be arrested for libel? Anna leans forward to the edge of the bunch with anticipation. She watches as Andrew Hamilton approaches Richard Bradley, who sits at the prosecutor's table holding his Bible. In a fast and startling move, Andrew Hamilton snatches the Bible from Bradley's hands and with a devious smile does he thumb through the pages for silent seconds. William Smith and John Chambers exchange uncertain glances of asking, Hey, do you know what he's up to now? John Peter Zenger is the only one smiling as he watches Andrew Hamilton approach the rows of spectators holding out the Bible. What if a man were to walk through the streets reading aloud from his Bible? Hypothesizes Andrew Hamilton as he finds the page he was looking for. If a man read aloud a passage not familiar to Mr. Attorney, might he find himself charged with libel? Do join me in a bit of analysis, gentlemen. The jury watches as Andrew Hamilton paces the jury box, reading aloud from the Bible, while Richard Bradley sits there, looking helpless. How might Mr. Attorney interpret these words? His watchmen are all blind. They are ignorant. Yea, they are greedy dogs that can never have enough. Now does Andrew Hamilton gently close the Bible in his right hand. To make these words libelous, might Mr. Attorney alter their definition to mean his watchmen, meaning the governor's own counsel and assembly, are all blind ignorant? Hearing stunned gasps from the gallery of spectators, Andrew Hamilton turns to them and smiles wider as he approaches. His interpretation of the Bible only becomes more pointed. These watchmen will not see the dangerous designs of His Excellency. He places the Bible on the prosecutor's desk without even glancing down at Bradley. Yea, they, who be the governor and his counsel, are greedy dogs that can never have enough. Then does he turn to the jury and shrug. Self-explanatory. <laughs> the jury and spectators erupt in laughter, more uproarious. Judge Delancey slams the gavel. Andrew Hamilton pays the slamming no mind and doth continue. See now how Mr. Attorney relies upon twisting the context of words to gain his aims. Never does he explain his methods of interpreting Mr. Zinger's words, nor justify why. Perhaps he too feels above explaining his actions to you. Think how he might twist the meaning of your words. Andrew Hamilton gestures to an elderly man and crouches down to speak eye to eye with him. What crime would he accuse you of simply for speaking of an aching back? 
He takes a few steps back and smiles to a tired, single woman. What accusations might he make of you, speaking of your tired eyes? I can only imagine how he will twist mine. The spectators look up as Andrew Hamilton walks further into the aisle, regarding every one of them eye to eye. The judges both grab their gavels and are about to dispute his entry into the gallery when they cautiously decide not to. Some of the spectators nervously look at the grim, admonishing faces of the judges and then see Andrew Hamilton and dare to smile at him as he passes by. He nods approvingly. Men like him injure and oppress people under their administration. And should you cry, ouch, you will be tried for libel, for sedition, for causing scandal. And then open yourselves up to more persecution and oppression. John Peter Zenger watches Andrew Hamilton turn and walk back out of the aisle and back toward the jury. He just happens to glance at the cringing judges and suddenly feels like all the nonsense he's contended with thus far was worth it just to see them shrink in their high chairs. The question before the court and you, gentlemen of the jury, is not small and private. It is not just the cause of a poor printer, nor the city of New York alone. No, your decision will affect every free man living under a British governor on the main of America. It is the cause of liberty. Your conduct this day will not only entitle you to the love and esteem of your fellow citizens, but to every man who prefers freedom to slavery. Your decisions can lay noble foundation for securing our posterity, our liberty, and more. Allow us to speak and write the truth against arbitrary powers. Tired of stewing and sensing a moment to enter, Richard Bradley stands up. He looks to the judges, then eyes Andrew Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, you have gone out of your way to make merry this jury. You confess your client's guilt for establishing libel against the governor and his administration, and therefore, should the jury find him guilty? Judge Delancey clears his throat before speaking. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the jury, with great pains has Mr. Hamilton shown how little the jury should regard the opinion of the judges. But realize their confession. Realize how libel is a matter of law best left to the court to decide. And remember the words of a learned judge in a case of like nature. To say that corrupt officers are appointed to administer affairs is certainly a reflection of the government. The jury eyes Judge Delancey as he quotes on and on and on. One of them even eyes his pocket watch. Andrew Hamilton turns, ignores Richard Bradley, and eyes Delancey as he drones on. If people should not be called to accounting for possessing the people of ill opinion of the government, no government can subsist, for it is very necessary for all governments that the people should have good opinion of it. And if nothing, nothing can be worse to any government than to endeavor to procure animosities as to the management of it. This has always been looked upon as a crime. Sitting patiently at the defendant's table, John Peter Zenger leans over to John Chambers and speaks in low tones. What case? What case is the judge reading from? John Chambers need only turn a few pages of his own book, oh, his own book of Holt's. Chief Justice Holt's decision in Tuchin's case. What does it mean? In a nutshell, it means to say that no government would or should do anything to make the people displeased with it, and to consistently do so is a crime, replies John Chambers. He is attempting deception, asks John Peter Zenger. John Chambers nods. He says that no sane government with plans to survive would engage in campaigns that would cause its citizens to suffer. Delancey hopes the jury will not believe your journals and side with the governor. Judge Delancey is still quoting. Men are not adapted to offices, but offices to men of particular regard to their interest, and not to their fitness for places. That is the, su is the support of these papers. I humbly beg your honor's pardon, for I am misunderstood, says, Mr. says Andrew Hamilton as he glances back to the jury. Sir, you know I made apology for the freedom I took. 
these were not personal insults, but arose from the nature of our defense. Noted for the record, remarks Judge Delancey with a nod, the defense has no malicious intent in its choice of words. So, the jury will take this time to deliberate on its verdict, after which the court will reconvene to hear the decision. Slamming his gavel once, he stands. Taking the signal, the spectators stand, and the bailiff ushers them out of the room. John Chambers and John Peter Zenger stand and watch Anna and Peter look back and wave before moving through the double doors with the rest of the spectators. Son, even if we do not carry this day, we will stand by you for your appeal, says John P Chambers confidently. Had we been able to prove your true, your journals, I would be certain of your freedom. Is there a court that would let us prove the governor's offenses? If there is not, then we shall build it with our own hands, replies John Chambers. The jury watches as the two redcoats march into the room and stand by the defendant's desk. John Peter Zenger stands up and tries to hide his annoyance with their very existence. Rather, he smiles confidently to John Chambers and William Smith and then marches through the arch door, flanked by the Redcoats. Chapter 24. The lanky man lights the street lamp at the corner of Wall and Nassau Streets, thus illuminating the spectators as they exit down the front steps. He looks up to see the last rays of sunlight fade over the rooftops and then meanders down the block down to the next street lamp. The street from the courthouse, across the street from the courthouse of the New Yorkers conversing with the Jerseyite near a candlelit pub. Mr. Hamilton has them in a most precarious position, remarks the second New Yorker. The Jerseyite is curious. The judges? The jury? True enough, notes the first New Yorker. Had, he had an ulterior motive for calling that jury. How conjecture you this? asks the Jerseyite. The jury serves more than to keep the court in check, explains the second New Yorker with an eager smile. Mr. Hamilton has put twelve innocent men on the spot with Mr. Zenger. Indeed, agrees the first New Yorker. If the jury sides with the court, then Mr. Zenger is finished, and with him any future right of free speech. But if they side with Mr. Zenger, they risk reprisal by the court, suggests the Jerseyite. One wonders what charge the court would, might inflict on a jury, says the second New Yorker. Oh, this, can, this court can invent any charges it desires so long as the governor's ends are met, warns the first New Yorker. Be sure of that, my friends. The courtroom is now lit by candles between the tall arch windows. Thomas Hunt, the foreman, paces in a circle and appears to be contemplating. The other jurors seem to wait for him to compose his thinking before progressing to the next point. You discovered another irony, Mr. Hunt, asks Abraham Cateltis. Thomas Hunt nods. I found it odd how only legal precedents in libel cases came from jury trials. At the far end of the room, John Bell glowers as grim as an undertaker. No surprise, gentlemen. There are no records made for star chamber decisions. No juries. No opportunity to face an accuser. An unfair trial followed by an unfair execution. And that makes their crimes legal, remarks Thomas Hunt. John Bell smiles at the army. Well, wouldn't make sense to put an innocent person on trial, now would it? Abraham can tell us nods. I see your point, Mr. Bell. This, too, would have been a star chamber if not for Mr. Hamilton and his cohorts, notes uh, Jean Goulet as he spreads his arms. Work your thoughts now, gentlemen. Imagine that our right to freedom after speech would have been taken forever this night in this room. Egbert von Borsum is skeptical. Why does the governor so wish to control speech? There is no talk of armed rebellion in this city, only reform. Reform and rebellion could mean the same thing, remarks John Bell. The governor's intent is transparent, snaps Hercules Wendover. Control the language and you control the range of thought. Control thought and you restrict action. No one, no one think of revolution if it is not in their vocabulary. How many uprisings do you see on a pig farm, asks John Goulet. 
True, agrees Tom Hunt, Thomas Hunt. John Zenger is on trial for more than just informing the public. We would know nothing of the governor's agenda without him, says Ed Stanley Holmes. Perhaps he was put on trial to flush out whoever wrote the article, surmises Benjamin Hildreth as he examines Francis Harris's court records. We cannot know for certain. Edward Mann looks around for listening ears before he speaks. We would know if Mr. Zenger took the stand. What is he hiding? Rumors of his interrogation by persons masquerading as prisoners have persisted for months, says Harmonist Rutgers. If they learn anything, he'd be gone like the others, notes John Bell. Gentlemen, let's stay on point, suggests Thomas Hunt. Are we agreed to vote? There is silence as the juries look to one another and nod. The strain of this decision shows on their faces, and in the tired way they stand before the bench. Thomas Hunt steps into the circle of his fellow jurors and nods his readiness. All those finding for the prosecution signify by saying I. Chapter 25. It is moments later when the doors of the courthouse open and the bailiff stands holding a lantern. He looks down on the spectators as they stand on the front steps in small discussion groups speaking in low tones. Then does he wave the lantern side to side. The jury has reached a verdict! The crowd ascends the steps, remarking very little about how few moments it took for the jury to deliberate. The red coat guards stand on either side of the room, watching all whom enter as before. There is a feeling of anxious tension and overwhelming fatigue in the air this night as both sides look forward to closure. The gavel slams to the wooden block. Judge Delancey puts aside the gavel and pans his vision at Andrew Hamilton. The fatigued Richard Bradley and the jury as they take their seats. Looking to the jury, John Peter Zenger notices not one of them looking back at him. John Chambers leans over to him. Not a good sign when the jury does not look our way, says John Chambers. I am glad that you have friends in New Jersey, remarks John Peter Zenger with a smile. Judge Phillips breaks the silence. The defendant will stand. Tiredly, does John Peter Zenger stand. Andrew Hamilton, William Smith, and John Chambers stand at once and shoulder to shoulder with him to stare down the judges. Behind him, Anna and Peter pray. Judge Delancey looks to the jury, then nods to Francis Harrison, who quickly stands and turns to the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed of your verdict in the guilt of John Peter Zenger? asks Francis Harrison. Thomas Hunt looks to his fellow jurors, then stands and looks to the judges. The judges stare down on him. Thomas Hunt does not nod to them. We, the jury, in the trial of John Peter Zenger, do find him not guilty. Anna gasps, outraged, the judge's eyes go large and they sneer as, having as if having swallowed live rats. Andrew Hamilton smiles and turns to see John Peter Sanger, who laughs hesitantly. He looks around to, to see uproarious cheers and stops the spectators. Nearly a hundred yell, huzzah, three times. Dozens of spectators reach across the banister to shake hands with Andrew Hamilton. Two large men grab Anna under her arms, lift her up all over the banister, and put her into the arms of John Peter Zager, who spins her around and around and around and kisses her. Defeated, Francis Harrison looks to Richard Bradley and shakes his head. Every game they played, every verse they twisted, every fact they perverted, and now both of them felt sick to their stomachs. They both look across the room to see Anna still kissing John Peter Zager. William Smith and John Chambers shake hands and watch the pouting young judges stomp back into their chambers and slam the door. They turn to see a crowd of spectators congratulating them and extending their hands 
The two counselors shake hands with every man, every woman, every child within reach. Wiping the tears from her eyes, the tired woman looks beyond the wall of well-wishers to see Andrew Hamilton shaking hands with everyone near to him. Then the ominous Scotsman makes eye contact with her, smiles, and takes a bow. A, a smile comes to her face and she blows him a kiss. He could not help but blush. The short bailiff squirms down the aisle through the spectators and stands before the bench. He clears his throat. Everyone is still in a celebrating mood. He clears his throat again, louder. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, excuse me, citizens. Uh, uh, court is adjourned. The bailiff feels terribly ignored as the spectators swarm around John and Anna's anger. Peter moves through the crowd and hugs his father. Andrew Hamilton, William Smith, and John Chambers simultaneously remove identical metal flasks from their long coats, open them, and gulp down scotch whiskey. The bailiff clears his throat again. I say, court is adjourned, yes. Yes, you can all go home now. Nothing more to see. Right. Swept up in a wave of spectators, John, Ann, and Peter moved down the aisle toward the open doors. The two New Yorkers and the Jerseyites shake hands with John as he passes them. Closing their flasks, Hamilton, Smith, and Chambers watch as, and the, uh, as the Zenger family looks back at them, smiling, and are then carried through the doors and out of the courthouse. The press room of the New York Weekly Journal is candlelit, and the journeyman is placing the type on a bar. An apprentice picks up a platter of raised block print and connects it to the printing press. The other, two other apprentices hear the bells jingle and look to the opening door to see Anna enter, followed by Peter and then John, who now wears a brand new Scott tailored suit. Anna steps to the center of the shop and smiles while tears run down her face. Gentlemen, stop the presses. All work ceases. John Peter Zenger looks around his shop at all the hand-drawn and type-laden advertisements hung on the wall and is amazed. His apprentices and the journeymen stalk toward him and shake hands. A single dry page one showing a grim sketch of Gov Governor Cosby falls to the floor. Reaching into a cool water barrel near the door, the journeyman pulls a bottle of dark beer. He opens it and erupts like a geyser. The apprentices laugh. The journeyman hands the beer to John Peter Zenger, and he drinks it down in seconds. He is home again. John Peter Zenger continued publishing the New York Weekly Journal with his family and was naturalized in New Jersey in 1738. He died on July 28, 1746, at the age of 49. Anna Zenger went on publishing the journal with her three children, until 1748. It was turned over to their first son, John Peter Zenger Jr., until the journal ceased publication in 1751. Benjamin Franklin rose to fame as a publisher, statesman, inventor, and scientist. He spoke out against the Stamp Act on the floor of the British Parliament and was among those who signed the Declaration of Independence. During the revolution that followed, he sought an alliance with the French in 1787, he inspired adoption of the U.S. Constitution before his death in 1790. Andrew Hamilton resumed status as a barrister in Philadelphia and went on to design Independence Hall. He died on August 4, 1741, exactly six years to the day of the final Zenger trial. James Alexander and William Smith who returned to status as barristers in Manhattan in 1737. Richard Bradley held his office until his death, death in 1752. History remembers him as a filer of cases designed to squeeze money from the accused rather than prosecuting based on legal and just cause. William H. Cosby died in 1736. Many of his administration were ultimately removed from office. Among those removed was Francis Harrison, who died penniless and homeless on the streets of England. Governor Lewis Morris was quoted as saying, The trial of John Peter Sanger in 1735 
was the germ of American freedom, the morning star of that liberty which subsequently revolutionized America. And now to the bibliography. This book was derived from actual court records and research materials. The Case and Trial of John Peter Zenger, written by James Alexander, uh, the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1963. The 1989 Notable Trials Library Edition has an introduction by Alan Dershowitz. The Trial of Peter Zenger, edited and with an introduction and notes by Vincent Berenelli, Washington Square, New York University Press, 1957. John Peter Zenger, written by Livingston Rutherford, General Editor, Professor Daniel Aaron of Harvard University, Chelsea House, New York, London, 1981. The Autobiography and Other Writings by Benjamin Franklin, edited by Peter Shaw, a Bantam Classic Book, copyright, 1982, New York. The news media is meant to inform the governed, not serve the governors. That was true in 1735. Look around you. Is it true now? To the citizens of Gotham, gratitudes for viewing this novel into streaming video production. And gratitudes to Mac HQ and YouTube. You've seen my novel, and I have many more works in production. Good day, Gotham City, wherever you are.